reconstruction of Vaslav Nijinsky's ballet The Rite of Spring. The notes for his original choreography were lost soon after its first performance in 1913, and tonight's program in the Russian season follows the search for and eventual recreation of this lost work. Like hieroglyphs from an extinct civilization, these pictures of a vanished ballet have never lost their fascination. On May 29, 1913, in Paris, the curtain went up on Le Sacre du Printemps, the Rite of Spring. With choreography by the Russian dancer Vaslav Nijinsky, designs by the Russian painter Nicholas Rurik, and music by the Russian composer Igor Stravinsky. The riot that greeted the ballet on its opening night became a legend. And although the choreography soon disappeared, the music endured. A new century was underway, and in Paris the mood was one of infectious enthusiasm. Great strides were being made in science and engineering. Meanwhile, new kinds of dancing had begun to draw a broad audience. Ballet had been left behind. In 1906, all Paris was talking about an exhibition of Russian paintings at the Grand Palais, organized by the Russian impresario Serge Diaghilev. The following season, he introduced audiences to the Russian opera. And in 1909, he returned with a company of dancers. His ballet russe conquered Paris. Over the course of the next 20 years, Diaghilev gathered around him choreographers, composers and painters who would go down in history as the greatest of their time. In Stravinsky, Diaghilev found a promising young composer and hired him to write for the ballet. His scores for Firebird and Petrushka instantly made him the most famous composer of his generation. In Nijinsky, Diaghilev had a great artist and a star attraction. Among his admirers was Marie Rombert, who assisted Nijinsky during the making of the Rite of Spring and danced in the ballet herself. And indeed, I could say that when he danced Spectre, he was the very perfume of the rose, because in everything he extracted the essence. In Sylphide, he was the very soul of Chopin. In Petrushka, he was like the pain of every man weighted down by fate. Nijinsky's ambitions went beyond performing. He wanted to choreograph ballets that would break new ground. Diaghilev encouraged him. Nijinsky's first ballet, The Afternoon of a Fawn, scandalized the audience with an ending that was sexually explicit. Some French critics accused him of ignoring the subtleties of Claude Debussy's music. Others, however, admired the ballet for its stark originality. was that the feet, both parallel, were going in one direction and the body was facing the audience and the arms were facing the audience but you walked on one line. With Je, his second ballet, Nijinsky established himself as a choreographer who was leading the way into the future. Je was the first ballet in modern dress, and it was based on a post-Freudian love triangle. 
I thought I was deeply interested in his art and I admired it and so on. I knew, and everybody in the company knew, that he lived with Diaghilev, he was homosexual. And so that I sort of prevented myself from being in love with him. After Fawn, Diaghilev had begun laying the groundwork for a new ballet, proposed by Nicholas Rurik, a renowned Russian painter and archaeologist, whose art reflected his avid interest in primitive cultures. Later, Stravinsky recalled having a similar idea. I had dreamed a scene of pagan ritual in which a chosen sacrificial virgin dances herself to death. Reaching Switzerland in the fall, I rented a house in Claram for my family and began to work. I put the piano on this wall. I worked from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. I continued to work after the dinner. When I was very, very tired, I went to bed. And I remember I slept very well. And I put on the door, it is here in French, it is here that I, I am composing the Sacre du Printemps. And I said, Igor Stravinsky. I like very much this corner. <laughs> a new chord, you know, or eight notes chord, but the accents were even more new. And the accents were uh, uh, really the, the foundation of the whole thing. When I finished composing the Rite of Spring, I played it for Diaghilev. And I started to play him this chord, 59 times the same chord. Diaghilev was a little bit surprised. He didn't want to offend me. He asked me only one thing, which was very offending. He asked me, will it last a very long time this way? And I said, till the end, my dear. And he was silent, because he understood that the answer was serious. In search of someone who could help Nijinsky and the dancers with Stravinsky's score, Diaghilev visited the studio of Emil Jacques Dalcroze, who had devised a method of translating musical rhythms into movement called Eurythmics. Dalcroze's star pupil, Marie Rombert, was hired. And for a company who was used to ram ta ta pum pa pa pum pa pa pum pa pa, of course it was awfully difficult and they hated it heartily. They made my rehearsals very difficult. And Stravinsky arrived. He said, this is not at all the tempo. This has got to be quicker. This has got to be slower. Nijinsky said, this can't be quicker and this can't be slower. I know what the dancers can do. There was an epic battle between them. Stravinsky sat at the piano and trying to make an orchestra. He stamped with his feet and banged with his hands on the piano here and there and shouted and sang and so on. And, you know, I can't remember who won. <laughs> it really is well over half a century ago. In a theatre that had been awash in pastels, Diaghilev's ballets burst onto the stage. Paris audiences were captivated by a Russia they imagined to be a land of vivid splendour and noble savagery. The exoticism that Diaghilev introduced was soon the height of fashion, and Paris society looked to the Ballet Russe as the epitome of style. Expectations for Nijinsky's new ballet were running high. So were tensions between Gabriel Astruc, the impresario for the new Theatre des Champs-Élysées, and his audience, who found his programming too progressive. There had even been complaints about the new theatre itself, later featured in Marcel Lerbier's 1924 film La Nuit Men. The architecture was considered too Germanic, not suitably French in style. On May the 29th, 1913, in the middle of an unseasonable heat wave, 
the rite of spring opened. At the performance, mild protests against the music would be heard from the beginning. Then, when the curtain opened, the storm broke. It was terribly difficult to hear the orchestra because of all that noise in the audience. I left the hall in a rage and I remember slamming the door. I have never again been that angry. There was a most dreadful row. One woman went out of a box and slapped a man who was clapping. It's a chosen maiden. When she does the strength and dance, you know, she stands like this. That moment, somebody from the gallery called, Ah, oh, doctor! And we continue to dance. in a fury. There I saw Dagger switching the house lights on and off in the hope that this might quiet the hole. Then when somebody called a oh, artist, somebody else shouted the artist. For the rest of the performance I stood in the wings behind Nizhinsky and holding his jacket while he stood on a chair shouting numbers to the dancers. When it was all over and the curtain came down, Nizhinsky came down from where he stood because he stood on a chair in the wings directly and said, Dura publica, means mm. public, fool of a public it is. The reviews ranged from baffled to irate. We only gave four performances and then we came to London where it made no effect whatsoever. And that was the life of that ballet. The Rite of Spring was the climax of Nijinsky's career as a choreographer, which was soon aborted. On the company's South American tour later that season, Nijinsky married Romola Dopolsky. The wife of the conductor came in and said, Great news, wonderful news, Romola and Václav are engaged. And I bent down, I had a trunk under the thing and pretended to rummage in it, and hot tears were streaming from my eyes. I then realized that I was desperately in love with him, which I never realized. And that evening, I went on the, I don't know, the prow of the ship or what, where a huge wind was blowing. And I bent down and was hoping, hoping, hoping that the, that the waves would swallow me. Diaghilev immediately dismissed Nijinsky. Over the course of the next few years, he grew increasingly unstable, and as his condition declined, he was diagnosed as schizophrenic. Many cures were tried, but to no avail. Nijinsky died in England in 1950. In the meantime, Rurik had continued designing for the stage, founded a school in New York, and eventually settled in the Himalayas, where his paintings became more preoccupied with religious imagery. Stravinsky too had moved on, but his score for the Rite of Spring had taken on a life of its own in the concert hall, where it was promptly recognized as a modern masterpiece. I was guided by no system whatever in the Sacre Printemps. I had only my ear to help me. I heard and I wrote what I heard. I am the vessel through which the Sacre passed. Though the score has since inspired many other choreographers, Nijinsky's version lived on in the memories of the witnesses. In Sacre du Printemps, Nijinsky was bent on reproducing every note of the music. In the end, I think he was right, because the music was so powerful and its rhythmic impact so tremendous that when it was all done by a company, of magnificent dancers as they were, that practically doubled the impact of what Stravinsky had written. Years later, Rombert founded her own company. Among the choreographers who worked for her was a young American by the name of Robert Joffrey. In 1955, when I was 24 years old, I was invited to go to London to stage ballads for the ballet Rombert. I used to ask her all about Nijinsky in my eyes, he was the great dancer that I had never seen. 
And I think it's, it's amazing is here you had this great dancer with enormous facility for classical technique. And when he choreographed, he didn't use that. But I'm sure without the encouragement of Diaghilev behind him, telling him to go on, do what you want to do, you know, make a mistake, but do it. And I think that that help is what encouraged Nijinsky to do something that was so unique and so different for its time. Inspired by Diaghilev's example, Joffrey created a company of his own. And over the years, he acknowledged his debt by reviving important ballets of the Diaghilev era. Nearly 60 years after the Rite of Spring opened, Millicent Hodson, a young American graduate student, got interested in Nijinsky's ballet. Now remember, this was 1971. I was so struck by the contemporary look of the dancers in sock. The headbands, the braids, and the hand-painted costumes. Also, the way the feet turned in and the, the vulnerability of the posture was something that in fashion photography right then was very popular. And I started thinking about why did someone make a dance like this in 1913. Hodson met Robert Joffrey and discovered that he shared her interest in the Rite of Spring. Because Robert had been in England with Rambert in the 50s, had seen her demonstrate some of the movement, and so perhaps for this reason, more than anyone else, he believed in the possibility of recovering this work. With the exception of Marie Rambert, all of the people instrumental in creating the Rite of Spring were dead when Hodson began her research. Even if many dancers had survived from the production, no one else knew every step of the ballet, but Rambert, both for Robert Joffrey in her kitchen and for me in her parlor later, 15 years difference in that time, she would sing parts of the music. And this was quite wonderful because you knew exactly where she was talking about in the choreography. A rehearsal score that Rambert herself had notated soon after the ballet's premiere was the only surviving record of Nijinsky's choreography. I went to her and asked for it, and she had lost it. The original she had sold, to make money for her company. But somewhere in her house, she said, was a copy that she had not been able to find. Early in the research process, I began working here in London with the materials of the Theatre Museum, which include the collection of drawings by Valentin Gross. Valentin Gross, like many other young artists in Paris, went to the premiere to see the ballet. And she seems to have not planned to record this dance for posterity. But once she started, it seemed obsessive that she realized she had to finish. When I talked with Rumbert, she was telling me, now don't believe those nice ones. Those show Valentine Gross in her admiration for Isadora Duncan. The little drawings, the fast ones that, that Valentine Gross did in the theater, like not even looking, just drawing, not looking. They have this kind of wooden quality, and this was what Rambert said. She said, be blunt, you know, use that wooden quality, because that's what it really was. In the course of her research, Hodson met Kenneth Archer, whom she later married, an art historian and an authority on Nicholas Rurik. He shared her conviction that Sacra could be revived, and embarked on his own research to recover Rurik's designs and to explore the attitude of the Russians towards their own past. They felt that Russia had gone too far uh, into being influenced by the Europeans, by the French in particular. And so they wanted to look back into their, their own roots. So Rurik was part of that movement. Rurik was a guru, one might say, to Nijinsky. He was taken with Rurik's uh, historical approach. And Rurik had told him about the ancient Slavs and their rituals. And he was very impatient to get Rurik's designs and costumes before he would start. He wouldn't start the choreography until he had these. Well, we've researched for Sark in quite a number of places, in, in five countries, in, in three continents. In London, we worked at the Theatre Museum. That was the most important, the collection there. Also in New York. The Nicholas Rourke Museum, and in um, York, the Castle Howard Costume Galleries which for both of us actually was very important, the work at Castle Howard, because we could have so much immediate contact with the material and with the costumes, the uh, accessories and so on. Mm. I'm trying to see if there's another line in there. It's just gotten faded out, or is that just... Mm. I guess that's just the bottom line of the squares. So I'll have a closer look. I managed to find 80% of the costumes and a good number of the accessories. Count squares. That would help, mm. wouldn't it? Yeah. 
I count the number of squares and make no, I don't think there is another one. There are designs on the costumes, actual shapes, circles within circles, squares, diagonal crossings, crossbone effects that you can actually see in the ground patterns of the choreography. As regards the decors, what I had to do was to find Eric's original designs. The first one was the easiest because there was a reproduction in the magazine that was in black and white. And I had all the, the verbal evidence from the, the critics at the time. And I took color from Eric's other variants and some of his Slav paintings that he did at the same time. Now for act two, it was much more difficult because I couldn't find uh, a Rurik visual, but um, I did find um, in this museum his 1930 backdrop in which he'd synthesized the two sets for act one and two in 1913. So one of the ways I worked was deconstructing that, taking away the um, elements that I knew from the first act and what remained was helpful for the second act. As the next step in the reconstruction, Hodson and Archer organized the information they had gathered in notebooks that would serve as blueprints. His for supervising the execution of the costumes and sets, hers for staging the dance. I kept them in different forms over all the years I was working and essentially filled in the blanks. I would have the layering on of what Stravinsky had said in his notes about that moment in the music, what Rambert had said, what I knew from the critics, what I knew from any of the memoirs of the dancers that they had written, and also visually, what in relation to those few measures could I prove from visual sources. Then I had my own drawings that interpreted the verbal material. Five years after Hodson started working in earnest, Rombert's score resurfaced. When she died, her archivist found in the bedroom wardrobe at the very bottom this uh, score that she had notated. I don't think that had I found it in 1979 when I first asked her for it, that I could have done with it what I could do in 1984, because not having it forced me to go all around it. And having it then gave me the confirmations and the directions that I needed to finish. Joffrey's experience with reconstruction and his eye for detail informed the process. He would ask you questions. In this sense, it, it was as though he had the, the capacities of a very great teacher, I think, in that sense, that he wasn't asking for things for himself. He was asking, not even for his company. He's asking them for dance. And what should one do if there's, a, if there's a gap, if there's a costume missing or if there's a piece missing in the choreography? And he said, well, you have two points, mm. the, the points which you've established from the evidence that you have. You just find the shortest line between the two and bridge it in a style which is um, in harmony with every other piece of material that you have. Despite my hundreds of drawings of hundreds of figures, finally on the human bodies in action, these details had to be made live. And in this, the dancers worked with me very closely. I mean, I completed the reconstruction on them and with them in the rehearsal studio. And this drawing reminds me of an anecdote with Robert Joffrey. When he came to a rehearsal late in the process, he saw this one moment and he stood up and he said, storks. And we all looked at him, storks. And he said, that's what she called it, rumbear. When the three women come, very tall, on three quarter point, their arms very flat to the audience. He said, they called the three women storks because this movement, they pick their way across the stage. For the dancers, it was the most amazing moment probably of the reconstruction because they saw the historical process. They saw Robert Joffrey remembering what Marie Rambert had told him in 1955 that was directly related to that instant of music. Joffrey's involvement in rehearsals was eventually curtailed by serious illness and he died six months after his efforts to bring the Rite of Spring back to the stage finally succeeded. The actual event of the ballet that gives meaning to the whole thing is this question of sacrifice and the idea is that there is this marriage between a member of this ancient tribe and the sun god that the young woman dances in order to save the earth i don't see it um as a primitive and brutal thing that this woman 
dances herself to death. I see it as an expression of, of faith that human activity can have that impact. On September the 30th, 1987, the curtain went up on the reconstituted Rite of Spring. Ironically, given its history, it was the hit of the Joffrey season. But the myth that surrounded this ballet is now enshrouded in a new set of questions. Is any evidence, however complete, sufficient basis for exhuming a dance that's been dead for over half a century? Is this or isn't it the ballet that Nijinsky choreographed? The controversy continues. <laughs>